Welcome to the Fishwash Club podcast. In this show, we will be chatting to leaders, influencers, wine producers, restaurants, international importers, and other role players in the wine industry, and many more. Tune in every week for your latest episode. You will find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram TV, Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Google Podcast. Good day, everyone, and welcome back to the Fishwash Club podcast. Um, today, I'm speaking to Kevin Lynch. Kevin is um, from Epic Wines in Canada. Um, welcome to our show, Kevin. Uh, thanks, Well, It's great to be with you. Oh, it's really um, nice of you to take the time to talk to us. Uh, Kevin, uh, could you start by um, telling us a bit about yourself and uh, how you became involved in the wine industry? Sure. Yeah, I've been uh, I've been involved in the wine industry for ooh, it pains me. Oh my gosh, pains me to say. Sorry, that was a telephone call. Um, pains me to say about twenty one years. Now I started uh, I started working in the beverage alcohol industry for a company called Seagram Canada, a large mm -hmm. Canadian company that had Crown Royal and Absolute and a number of different spirits. And we had a small or we had a um, a winery in Napa called Sterling. And that was my first introduction to wine. And after that, I, I left Seagram and went to work for the former South Corp, which then became Foster's Wine Estates and then Treasury Wines. So um, a large Australian wine company, you might know from Lindemann's, Penfolds, Rosemount Estates, uh -huh. Wolf Glass, so on and so forth. Well, that's interesting. Um, and uh, uh, how did you um, end up starting um, Epic Wines or become involved with Epic Wines? How did that start? Yeah, I, I, we, myself and my business partner, Daphne Christie, we started Epic Wines almost uh, seven years ago now, seven years ago this February. Um, basically, the two of us had just done a number of different things in the wine business, and I had always had a vision of maybe starting my own agency here in Ontario, Canada, and representing imported wines, some domestic wines as well, but imported wines and helping them find their way to the Ontario market and sell to the LCBO. Okay, excellent. So, um, is this your um, uh, your only channel um, that you have to sell the LCBO, or do you have other? You know, so you only sell in Canada. Yes, we do. Yeah, we're we're based in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Uh, we sell mm -hmm. to the liquor liquor control board of Ontario, so the large uh, government monopoly. Uh, depending on the year, the LCBO is regarded as possibly the largest, or second, or third largest buyer of beverage alcohol in the world. So we are predominantly working with the LCBO. We do work with some other um, government monop government monopolies in Canada, um, in in the other in some of the other provinces, like Manitoba and uh, Nova Scotia and Saskatchewan, and some of the other places. But predominantly, we are in based in Ontario. Um, what's the service that Epic Wines actually give to the um, wine producer? Yeah, so we actually well we do a number of things. So. For what we call a full service uh, beverage alcohol or wine um, agency. And in Ontario, the way it works is we help imported wine. So wines from around the world and all the different gr wine growing regions. We are essentially their sales and marketing arm here in, in the province of Ontario and in Canada. We sell the product um, that we find that we you know, from our partners to the, the buyers at the LCBO. We have salespeople that then go in and uh, to the retail stores and the uh, restaurants and on-premise shops and sell the wines to not only the retail stores, but the restaurants. We help with compliance and logistics and pricing and essentially all the trade marketing um, that we do in, in, the, in the market. We then, and we try and help our suppliers who then possibly like the fish wise have a larger, broader uh, brand marketing plan because it's because the fishwives are sold in so many countries around the world, we try and then take that, tailor it to our business here in, in Ontario, in order to uh, build some brand exposure for for the, for the brand and the wines. Oh, that's amazing! So, I mean, how did you get involved with South African wines? You know what? I've actually been selling so I've been selling South African wine for the again for the better part of 
Oh, let me think. Uh, it's probably it's probably going close to sixteen or seventeen years. Um, in a previous in a previous career before I started Epic Wines and Spirits seven years ago, I worked for a large, <clears throat> pardon me, Canadian distributor, and uh, we represented Distel. So we had wines like oh, okay. Niederberg, um, Obiqua was another one. There's a number of different South African wines we sold from from uh, Distel, and now uh, but now we work with mainly smaller um, family owned, you know, wine brands, wine companies, or wineries from South Africa. Oh, that's awesome. So um, how long have you been selling South African wines then? Yeah, well, we've been selling, so Epic's been selling uh, South African wine since our very start. We started working uh, seven years ago. We started working with, uh, Thomas Webb, who's the owner, um, of the family owned business of Salima Mountain Vineyards and Stellenbosch. And then, uh, and just recently, we started working with the Fishwives Club and Patrick. Oh, that's amazing. Um, tell us, um, if uh, the producers out there and they're, they're looking um, to, to start selling in Canada, um, what do you guys look for uh, in a producer? And what does the producer need to do to get your attention? Right. Great question. Um, the Fishwives is a great example. They, uh, they have just an outstanding package and label. It's one of those, it's, it's a brand that just, uh, it jumps out at people. So obviously like there's lots of wines out there and lots of labels and people are very proud of their family labels and that's great. And we, you know, the, there's a certain place for, for, all, for all labels and brands. However, I think that depending on whether you are a more commercial wine, so you're looking, you know, something that, that does more volume, it's probably more, it's priced more every day for people to buy all the time. You want to be more, um, you know, fun and attractive, and and something that really stands out. You know, I think that that's very important. Nowadays, you know, there's so much wine out there from different countries, and especially in the new world where you've got South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Chile, Argentina, you know, North America, you know, so California, you really have to um, you really have to have your your marketing hat on and make sure you have a wine brand and a label that has a story that has something to say and then it obviously it has the has the juice in the bottle to back up the story and the attractiveness of the of the package well it sounds interesting i think um uh you know especially with the, the market the way it's now with everything going on it seems like if you um focusing on brand building this this helps to um you know, to make it successful. And, and the Fishers Club has been quite successful um, in the short time it's been in Canada. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sorry, the last part of your question kind of broke up a bit, Will, but you said, yeah, in terms of the short period of time for the Fishwives, yes, it's been very successful. The, um, you know, the brand is really, it's, you know, just the brand and the story behind the brand on empowering women and to some of the great um, small little marketing tools that, the Fishwives team have developed like their neck tags that have just some fantastic sayings. I think has really resonated with consumers. It's it's great wine, um, first and foremost too. So when you get a Sauvignon Blanc, that's the one wine that we sell right now here in Ontario, and it's really really resonated with consumers because the taste is is fantastic. It's it's not it's not overpowering. It's it it doesn't have you know to me the you know some characteristics from Sauvignon Blancs can be very very um, not overpowering, but very, you know, it's, it's, it can either be love or hate. Whereas this wine kind of appeals to all different types of palates. People can drink it on its own or with food and, um, and enjoy it the same. Oh, that's awesome. Do you, do you see a market for um, some of the other um, cultivars as well? Yes. Like, you know, you know like, well, yeah, like the South African, Sorry, I think your question was, you know, what's it like, you know, in terms of the South African wine market, there's, mm. you know, it's, it's been dominated by the brand, big brands like Two Oceans, um, Fleur de Cap, um, a, number of, a number of others. And I think that the South African wines in Canada kind of is in, is in kind of need for a refresh and probably to bring in some, some new brands and some new products that, um, you know, that, that I think appeal to the younger, the younger generation and younger consumer. So, uh, Kevin, um, uh, you know, um, the, the, the restrictions and um, it's always interesting to me in a regulated market like Canada, where you, where you have one monopoly of selling everything. Um, ultimately, today, consumers want to interact with a brand and 
if you really want to build a brand, you need to interact with your, your ultimate end buyer. How can brands do that more? Is it even possible? And, and uh, you, you know, besides uh, things on the shelves, is there other things that we can do to, um, to talk to those consumers and, and show us more, do more of what the brand's about? Yeah, so that's well, that's a great question. Well, basically, you're right. In a in a government monopoly, um, like the LCBO is a world class retailer, but they are but they use their own branding in their own stores. So it's it, <clears throat> they have begun to relax that a little bit and allow, you know, producers, wineries, distilleries, breweries to kind of use some of their branding in their stores to an extent. Um, but it doesn't always give this doesn't always I guess translate the same message that the that necessarily maybe the <clears throat> the brand producer wants to, so I think that nowadays with everything that's that's happening with with the with what the world is going on and a lot of social distancing and not even be able to really interact inside retail stores, <clears throat> pardon me, the the ability to communicate to our uh, our consumers whether you know through all social media channels is the best way to get to them. You know, television and radio advertising and even print advertising or out of home can be very expensive. So finding a balance or finding something <clears throat> that can be um, ha have, you know, ha really have an economical return for the brand, but still be able to uh, communicate to their consumers. So that's why we find that whether being using any one of Instagram, Facebook, um, you know, a number of different platforms that we can communicate with the consumer um, in, the, in the means in which they're using the most now. Oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, uh, as you say, uh, you know, people's attentions are, on, are basically on their phones all the time. And uh, we find that in most markets that, um, I'm not sure about the Canadian market, but that attention on um, social media advertising is underpriced in relation to, like you said, um, radio advertising and other means of advertising are quite expensive. Um, are there any regulations regarding, um, can, can you place ads on social media um, in Canada for wine or um, is it only, can you only communicate? No, yeah, absolutely. So you can place ads through Facebook, through Instagram, um, just to name, just to name two. Um, the, there are some, there are obviously, yes, there are regulations in Canada on what you're allowed to put in the ad. For example, mm -hmm. um, a, a, con a consumer cannot be shown um, or sorry, a person cannot be shown consuming a beverage alcohol. So they can't be actually holding a bottle or a beer or can or glass of wine to their lips and actually drinking it, but they can be shown in a setting where they may be, you know, in a backyard, backyard barbecue or at a party and the wine is in the glass on the table with the bottle near it. And that is kind of what you're allowed to show in terms of, you know, images in terms of beverage alcohol. But, um, those types of images, those still shots that that nowadays are becoming more and more important, whether we put it on Facebook or Instagram, it's showing kind of what the brand image is, but it also gives, you know, we also want to be able to show the bottle and the label and and then be able to tell a short story if we can about the about the brand. What's interesting about, you know, our, our marketing at the Fish Wash Club is that um, we've used a lot of marketing that actually never show the product because it's such an aspirational brand. We show just somebody in a sitting in a in a in a you know in a in a in a mountain lodge with snow, just with yeah. a, you know sitting and enjoying something. It might not even even just a woman reading a book. There might not even be a glass of wine, and it still works. Right. <laughs> Very interesting. No, for sure. It's the it's about a yeah. It is. It's about a you know. It can be sometimes about a way of life or an image or the way you want to see yourself, and then then people are really identify with brands that they feel fit the image that they want right i think that's right and and also like you said i think what's very very important what consumers want to hear is the story behind the brand um you know and i think that is that is where uh, a lot of brands can can learn in these times um as you know in south africa we're sitting with a, a complete um alcohol ban at the moment and also yeah. with a glass of wine because of that i think there's like 300 million liters of wine um, um, surplus. So if you're just competing on price, you're basically going to go nowhere. So you, you, the, the guys that are not brand building are going to lose that over time. Um, yes. Yeah, I think for sure. I, 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 I knew. You know, obviously, I know what the situation is like in South Africa and the total alcohol ban right now, which is very disappointing for me for me to hear for sure. Um, 
and that there will be eventually a glut, I'm sure. And then, and then th there will be some producers that will just want to sell um, in order to move the wine and they will sell it a little, you know, at, at a break even or even a loss. But that doesn't do anything for your brand. And frankly, that will only end up hurting a brand. That is unfortunately true, yes. And this is happening mm -hmm. already because some guys are desperate to get their sellers empty for the new harvest because we are, we, we actually, the, the sad thing about this year is, um, you know, we're actually having quite a good crop. <laughs> you know, we really, yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's almost, uh, yeah, it's a bit ironic. Um, Figures. Yeah, because it's been drying, drying the wine areas for a number of years. And this year it's been raining quite nicely. And um, yeah, there's, there's going to be a bumper crop. So that's huh. interesting. Interesting. Uh, you also mentioned, you know, the, the changing times and stuff like that. And, um, you know, the coronavirus has forced almost everyone to rethink their business models. Do you guys have any changes or um, new ideas in mind? You know, again, yeah, we've, well, we've certainly yeah, taken the last 10 months to make sure that we're looking at the alternatives. The, the biggest alternative for everyone, at least in this market, I'd say anybody in North America or even possibly around the world, is that with the change in times, we've all had to focus more on our e-commerce business and having the ability to sell wine from our website um, and then having it delivered to consumers at home. That has been something that even the, you know, the large retailers are doing it. You know, unfortunately, with coronavirus and the restaurants basically having been shut down for the better part of eight out of 12 months in 2020, they've obviously had to find a way to engage people so that they'll order takeout or eat their, you know, eat the restaurant food at home. Right. And so we're kind of doing the same thing with um, there are going to be people that don't want to go to a retail store or uh, to, to buy products because they want to, they feel more comfortable right now buying online. So that's certainly something where we've, we've looked at our website to try and make it a little bit easier for consumers to order from our website um, with, you know, with a delivery charge or in some cases without a delivery charge, if we're in, if they're in the immediate area, then we can deliver it to them. So, and I think that's only going to evolve, right? People are going to find more and more ways to be able to allow consumers to shop online. Well, we've launched the Fishers Club Boutique this year and this, that uh, actually last year, and, and that works very, very well, which is a, you know, a direct consumer uh, uh, avenue. Um, yes. So, so you, uh, so, so uh, explain to me quickly again the government monopoly. Is that only in the retail stores and to restaurants? And um, you, you guys, can you sell direct to consumer from your website so you can deliver to somebody's home? Right. So, well, yeah. So, the way it works right now, and it basically works this way in every single province or state, right? But province in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, except for one. But the way it works is every province has a liquor, uh, a liquor control board or a monopoly. Mm -hmm. And, um, the the you know majority of the business in 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 the province all goes through the, through the retailer and the liquor monopoly. However, um, the the big difference is that we can sell direct to consumers products that we bring in, but they have to come in through the LCBO warehouse. So uh, okay. agents like myself or, or producers, we aren't allowed to have our own bonded warehouses um, products. Al beverage alcohol products that come into the country or, or Canada or the province of Ontario in this case still have to come through the government retail warehouse or the government warehouse. That's where, you know, that's where they manage, they maintain control over what products are allowed to come into the, into the province, what products were allowed to sell direct to consumers, as opposed to selling uh, the products that the LCBO sells through their stores. Um, we can sell products directly to restaurants that the LCBO does not sell. We just have to have them brought into the LCBO warehouse and it's called the consignment warehouse where Epic has a, we have a small space and we bring products in that the LCBO have, has not bought in the hopes that we can then sell them either directly to consumers or in some cases to restaurants. Oh, that's interesting. So um, there's obviously a very effective way for them to make sure they get all the um, customs and excise duties on every single Correct. bottle sold. So, so, so Correct. Um, that, that, that makes sense. So, um, so you can use the their warehouse as a storage space, and how effective is it to, to ship from their warehouses to consumers all over the country in Canada? Is this a yeah, it's, that's the one. So that's that, that's another kind of a, a tricky subject is that we can actually only ship to consumers in the province of Ontario. Mm -hmm. Shipping product across 
provincial borders is technically against the law because while one province is getting the tax revenue from it, the consumer may be in another province and that province is not getting any tax revenue from it. So it's, uh, it's kind of tricky. They haven't figured out how they can, uh, how we can ship interprovincially yet. We are only allowed to ship within our own province to consumers. So if, you, on, if you're running a website and somebody orders from a different province, you've got to share, you've, you've got to um, store stock in that province as well. Either that, or I have to then hopefully have um, another someone like myself, an Epic Wines and Spirits, or a, another agency based in that province that would like to then sell or then or that sells the same brand. So, for example, if it's uh, fish wines, yeah, yeah, I have to then point that person in, let's say, Vancouver, Canada. If they contact me, I say, no, no, sorry, you're in Vancouver, I'm in Toronto. You need to speak to XYZ agency. They are the people that represent the fishwives in British Columbia. And so you could technically account. sell it on your website, collect the money, and then have the order fulfilled by a different um, uh, company. Is that possible? Uh, it's possible, but it's, it's something. It, it gets it probably gets a little messy from a from a financial reporting perspective, mm -hmm. and where and you know and again where taxes are being collected, sales yeah. taxes are being collected and paid and. It gets a little because messy. I suppose it becomes then a question is where did the sale take place? Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the cons the consumers in one city, but the, the the sale might be taking place in another city, and so yeah, it gets a little gets a little muddy. The water but don't you think uh, um, I'm, uh, um, that is the future though? That that people come to a website like Epic Wines, they, they buy a product and they can get it delivered wherever they are. Yes, yeah, for sure. That's why. That's why we continue to look at okay, how do we expand the reach across all the part of the all the parts of the country? How can we make it effective, you know, effective and efficient to either ship product across the country or have it available in other parts of the country, so that I'm not shipping something from Toronto to Vancouver, but it's basically from somewhere in Vancouver to another part of Vancouver, and that would be that would be much easier for sure. That's very interesting. Given that this 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 just shows you how the markets can change, right? So, um, right. I mean, you've been in this this game a long time. Um, so, what is the most important thing that you've learned from your um, wine journey? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, you know, again, it's it it really comes down. You know, in the end, it really does still come down to um, a couple of things. One, you know, you always the brands. There are brands that will that are tried and true, and they've been selling for a very, very long time and they've done very well, but they've maintained the quality of the wine inside the bottle, you know, over decades of time, they continue to make the same consistent, great product, which, which is really, really important. Um, and then, and really good producers also understand that their, what their brand was 20 years ago needs to evolve. They can still be the same brand, but it needs to evolve and be refreshed and, and grow with the times and what and grow with the consumers in terms of what people are looking for so those two things is continual innovation and and evolution of a brand is very important but also maintaining the quality and consistency of the product that's being consumed is what pe keeps people coming back that's amazing and isn't that what the french champagne houses has been doing for so many years very effectively correct yeah exactly that's what they're able to maintain year over year and it's and it's tough because essentially at the end of the day you know wine is is you know we're an agricultural product you know it's farmers mm -hmm. and and they have to deal with what mother nature gives them so it can be very difficult you know year over year you never know just like you said in south africa you have a bumper you have a bumper crop this year meanwhile it's it's hard to say you can't sell any wine right now in south africa and then there are years when you could possibly be selling your wine all over the globe, but Mother Nature doesn't cooperate and you get some of the smallest yields um, you may have ever had. So it's a testament to the winemakers and the people that are on the farms that learn how to kind of roll with the punches and do what they do in order to continue to make great product and as much as possible for whatever Mother Nature gives them. I think that's a lot, a lot of people forget is about wine. It's not a product, you know, like, a, like made in a factory. It's no, actually, it's actually a agricultural product farm. So that's um, interesting. You mentioned that. Given something else that I'm interested in is the actual wine industry in Canada. Is that how big is that? Is that growing? Yes. Well, yeah. Frankly, 
I can tell you that basically, you know, uh, at least over the last little while, we've been now working on on the terms, you know, pre-COVID and post-COVID because of what kind of happened, you know, in February of 2020, uh, when everything was kind of back to where what we used to know, there were, there were you know, wine was, wine was growing slightly or if not flat. Um, obviously, spirits have made a bit of a, a resurgence here in Canada, ready to drink. So the, the alcohol, you know, the, the low alcohol uh, carbonated uh, products that um, you see in North America, in Canada, North, and, and the United States, a lot have, have made a large resurgence, resurgence. But wine has kind of continued along after COVID hit and, you know, there were lockdowns in place and stay at home orders and no places to go to eat out. The wine business has, has, has grown again, you know, before, before COVID hit, there were a number of different countries that would have been in decline um, year over year. Now, just about every single country, uh, I would say every single country from around the world that we import into Ontario is growing again because of the, the consumer, um, response to COVID basically if we can't go anywhere well we're going to have to entertain ourselves at home and I guess we're and we're going to and if I can't go ahead and buy a really great bottle of wine at my favorite restaurant well I'm going to go and buy some great bottles of wine to drink at home or I'm going to buy two or three different bottles of wine to drink at home and that's what we've kind of seen so the wine business it is uh, is back growing again in Canada certain you know countries New Zealand continues to show phenomenal growth uh, from the new world to California as well um, he, being here on the eastern part of eastern side of Canada, um, a little closer to Europe, you know, we get the, there's a fairly large uh, European influence. So Italy and France are um, are very very big and strong categories. You get some emerging categories like Spain and um, and even you know I would say even in, and then from a white wines perspective, South Africa white wines have continued to grow. Um, so it's kind of going it's all over the place. But yeah, but more or less all of the uh, all of the categories are now growing once again. Do you have any local production? Yes, we do actually. Yeah, we have a very large, um, a, a pretty significant Ontario wine. Uh, so, so we have two really predominant wine growing regions in Southern Ontario, kind of where I am close to the Niagara Peninsula. So close to Niagara Falls, if you're familiar with Niagara Falls, the Niagara on the Lake area is, uh, is a, a, a fairly large growing region. Across the country, over in in British Columbia, there's the Okanagan Valley, which is on the kind of on the east side of the Rocky Mountains, and it, it's right at the northern tip of the Sonoran Desert. So, they've um, you know while they have a climate that is really conducive for growing um, red wine and strong big Bordeaux varietals, in Ontario here because we're we're um, we're southern, but we're right on the the Great Lake of Lake Ontario you get more of a climate similar to Burgundy. So we can make Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and some whites you can make some Bordeaux varietals, but typically it doesn't get dry enough or really, really hot enough in order to produce super strong Bordeaux reds. Um, but yeah, those are the two predominant ones. You know, the, there are other areas in Canada that are growing wine, not to the same extent as Ontario and British Columbia. Oh, very, very interesting. Kevin, it's mm -hmm. great. It's been great talk, talking to you. Um, Thank you. Can you give us your very own wine quote? You can steal you know, one if you don't have one. <laughs> I I racked my brain on this one, Will, and I thought to myself, I'm like, no, I don't know if I get, I don't I don't have one. I wish I did, and I and for fear of making a, a fool out of myself, I wasn't going to really press it because I was worried of making something up that was going to be, sound really stupid. So <laughs> I'm going to take a pass, and I'm going to think about it. And when I finally come up with one, I'm going to email you someday and say, Will, here's my wine quote. <laughs> Well, I suggest you drink um, one or two of your bottles in your cellar there. Maybe that will help you come up with a suggestion. I agree. I do get more creative with uh, when I when, when I enjoy a glass or two of wine. That's for sure. That's 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 awesome. Kevin, if somebody wants to get hold of you guys, how do they get hold of you? Oh my gosh, they can. So they can go on to our website. So they can go to um, www.epicwinesand and spirits.ca, CA is for Canada. Don't use the .com, use .ca. They can, uh, they can email us at contact at epicwinesandspirits.ca as well. Okay, Kevin, thank you very much. That is awesome. I'm Kevin Lynch from 
epic wine and spirits. Um, it was a pleasure talking to you. It was great to talk to you, Will. Thank you very much for the time and everything uh, that we're doing with the Fishwives. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's show. Please subscribe to get the latest episodes. All the links are in the description. Have a great day. Cheers.